Okay, good afternoon. Uh, today's lecture will be models for sequential data. So we've seen a lot of um, machine learning models for bas basically tables of instances where we sort of assume uh, without maybe making it that explicit that all the instances are independently sampled. Uh, so now we're going to look at how to approach this problem if your <coughs> instances, if the things you're looking at, have a very clear ordering in time, if they are a sequence. So I'll start by defining that properly and looking at some of the uh, some of the different situations this can happen, some of the different ways this can happen, the, the things you might encounter. Uh, and then we'll look at a, a very simple way of approaching this problem, which is called a Markov model. Uh, we'll look at a slightly different way of approaching the problem called an embedding model. Which does something slightly different and... and um, attacks a slightly different problem, but we'll um, focus on one of them called uh, word to vec as you can see here. Uh, so we hope to get that finished before the break. And then after the break, we will look at a particular type of neural network called an RNN, a recurrent neural network, which is a neural network that can read sequences And we'll focus on a particular type of uh, neural network called an LSVM, a long short-term memory network. We'll look at how those work, how to train them on sequences, and then we'll uh, look at a couple of examples of, uh, of what happens and what you can do with these kinds of models. Let's dig right in first with what kind of sequences can we expect? What kind of sequences do we see in the wild? Uh, there's a couple of different categories, and depending on what category you're in, you need different approaches. So I'll start with the simplest one, which is the uh, one-dimensional time series. Basically, a sequence of numbers. For instance, a price index over time, traffic flow over time, or in this graph, the number of suns sunspots observed over time. So that's fairly straightforward. Just a big sequence of numbers each one of them timestamped, and we might want to predict this or interpolate this or compute some statistics over that. We'll focus on the use cases later. For now, this is one thing that, they, that we can see, what kind of data that we can observe. Uh, they can be multidimensional as well, so if we, the sort of analog of having multiple features is for every point in time you observe multiple numeric values. For instance, the, uh, if you look at two index indices, the Amsterdam exchange and the FTSE 100, they both produce a number at every, uh, for, for every day. Uh, and you can plot that, those two numbers over time. Then you get, for every timestamp, you have two numbers. So it's a n-dimensional, in this case, a two-dimensional time series. And again, you might want to do, you might want to predict this or do other stuff with it. We'll focus on that later. So that's sort of the analog of having a um, data set with numeric features. Except here, the instances are ordered in time. Another option is uh, categoric features that we saw already. You can have those ordered in time as well. And the simplest example is probably words or language. So we see language is a symbolic sequence, so it's a sequence of symbols. Uh, we can look at it at different levels. So we can look at it at word level. Then we have a very large space of symbols from which we can sample uh, our vocabulary and we can represent a sentence like the cat said on the mat, like a sequence of those kinds of symbols. <coughs> but we can also look at the, the sentence at character level, which is sort of more uh, closer to the raw data. Uh, so then you have a longer sequence for the same sentence, and you just look at each character in isolation. And the uh, spaces in this case also become characters. <coughs> so those are very uh, straightforward often studied symbolic sequences. You can have multi-dimensional symbolic sequences as well. So at every point in time, you have 
two or more symbols. So for instance, if you have a sequence, it's, mu it's more rare, but if you have a sequence of words that are annotated with their uh, grammatical fe uh, their grammatical role, this is called uh, part of speech tagging. So if you have a part of speech tagged sequence, then you have two symbols for every word. Or if you want to represent something like music, which is always a difficult job, you will have to do it as um, uh, well, they're symbolic events. Every event can take a can be f uh, from a, a discrete space uh, of notes and then things like that. Uh, but you can have two notes at the same time, so it needs to be uh, unless it's monophonic music, it needs to be multidimensional. Uh, but like I say, this is a rare case. So basically, we can have numeric time series and symbolic time series. Those we can encounter. Um, then the question is, is your data set as a whole one sequence or a set of sequences? So for instance, if we're doing spam classification and we're not satisfied by extracting features from emails, we just want to do spam classification on the raw email text, then every email is a sequence which has a class. So our whole, our whole data set is not one long sequence, but our whole data set is a bunch of sequences together, each of which we want to classify. On the other hand, if we want to predict the number of sunspots next week, then our data set looks like this. This is our whole data set, which is one big sequence, and somehow we want to use this to predict uh, at any given moment what the next sequence is. So these are two different cases. Uh, we'll look at the single sequence case first, so we'll look at this case. So imagine we have this use case, we want to predict what the next, uh, what the number of sunspots is going to be given the history. Uh, a very simple approach is just to translate this into the sort of data set that we're used to. So we just, we have a bunch of, we have a, a single sequence now, but we just chop it into bits, chop it into instances, where the instances are points in time. And for each point in time, like here, the dark blue point two, we extract some features, in this case, the preceding three values. And we take that window and slide it over the data set, giving us a nice table with a bunch of features, t mi the, namely the value at t minus one, the value at t minus two, the value at t minus three, the previous three values and the target value that we want to predict, the value now. And now we're back in our comfort zone. Now we have a table with instances, features, and a target to predict. We can apply any regression uh, algorithm that we want, except that we have to take one thing into account, which is important. Uh, so remember, think about the real world use case. We want to predict a value given the values that precede it. So we need to be sure that when we make our test train split, we need to remember that we have uh, an inherent time dimension in the data. So when we sample the test and the train uh, data, it's important that we maintain this ordering because otherwise we are, uh, we might end up if we do this randomly, we shuffle it and then take one part added to the training data, take one part added to the test data, but we don't uh, honor this time uh, ordering, we might be training on data that is later in time than the test data. So we're seeing basically data from the future, which may or may not give us an advantage. That depends on the, on the setting. But if it does give us an advantage, then our test error is not going to be predictive for what we will see in the wild because, uh, or in production. Because in production, we will not have access to data from the future. So it's best usually in these kinds of settings to maintain the ordering over time strictly. Uh, if you want to do cross-validation in those settings, you need to do something called walk-forward cross-validation, walk-forward validation, sorry. So basically you take a relatively small validation set and you only train on data that comes before it. So when you start, you have a very small training set and then you walk the validation set forward training always only on the data that came before it. You get a bunch of uh, uh, scores 
uh, and you average them or you, well, in this case, the most recent ones are probably more indicative, so you can probably look at them, look at all of them, and take the later ones more seriously than the earlier ones, but you're basically still using, still getting multiple indications of what your, uh, what your performance is. And then during testing, if you want to um, test sort of the situation where you're up to the moment, so if your very recent examples are much more informative for your prediction than um, <clears throat> far away examples, like if there's a if you're predicting number of sunspots, and a recent spike is very informative, will tell you very uh, clearly whether that spike will continue or drop off, then it doesn't really help when you're sort of at the back of the test set to only train on this data. You want to move your recently observed data along as well, so then you want to do walk forward validation on the test set as well. So you're just basically updating after you've made a particular prediction for a particular point in time, you're updating the data that you've seen and retraining. So that's sequential data as we might in, may encounter it. And one cheap way of transforming it to basically tabular data that we're used to so that we can just basically apply any algorithm that we're used to. They might consist of numbers, vectors, or symbols. Uh, so remember to make a, a clear distinction between a sequence of instances and then uh, a sequence per instance or a sequence of instances. Uh, but both of them can, uh, if you apply feature extraction to both of them, they, you can translate them to traditional machine learning uh, settings. And in the rest of the lecture, we are going to focus not on traditional machine learning models, but models that are specifically designed to com uh, consume sequences. And we'll mostly focus on 1D symbolic sequences, so these language type things that we saw earlier. Um, but the extension to numeric sequences is usually pretty straightforward. We'll do this um, entirely, almost entirely in a probabilistic setting. So basically the main question we have to answer first is how do we model the probability of a particular sequence? So here we have a sentence consisting of five words which we might want to model. So we want somehow, by looking at some data and doing some training, to end up with a probability model over sentences. And then later on, we're going to look at how to use this for classification and for prediction and stuff like that. But for now, let's just answer the question, how do we build this model? How do we build a model over sentences that tells us how likely this sentence is relative to another sentence? So the first thing we do is we break up the sentence into words, where we uh, treat each word as a random variable. So the first word is a random variable, the second word is a random variable, and so on. So there are five different random variables, and we want to compute the probability over those five random variables. This is our probability distribution. So this is a joint distribution over uh, oh, six, sorry, I miscounted. This is a joint distribution over six random variables which is difficult to estimate. If you want to estimate this from raw data, just by looking at the, you would, uh, if you want to do this naively, you would look at the number of times you've seen this exact sentence over, uh, you get some data, look at the data, how often do I see this exact sentence? And then you divide it by the number of sentences of length uh, six. Uh, in order to get any real estimates, you would need an exponential amount of data. That's basically impossible. So we need to somehow break this down into smaller probabilities. We need to factorize it. And we will use, for that, the simple rule from the um, first lecture on probability, which derives directly for the, from the definition of conditional probability. So if we have a joint probability on two random variables, we can break it up like this by conditioning one on the other and multiplying it by the marginal probability of that one. And we will do this for this whole sentence in steps, in sequence, which is called the chain rule of probability. So 
Uh, note of warning, don't confuse this with the chain rule of calculus, which we've used a lot so far. They are completely different things. They just happen to be called, both be called the chain rule. So if we have a sentence now of four words, we can apply this rule we saw on the last slide and condition on the first word. So the probability over, uh, of this sentence is the probability of the last three words conditioned on the first word times the probability of the first word by itself. And now we can apply this rule from the previous slide again to this uh, factor on the left. And we work out the uh, second word into the conditional, which gives us another factor for the second word conditioned on the first. And we can do this again, and again, and again. And what we see, by uh, the end, we are left with only word four conditioned on the words one, two, and three, times the probability of word three conditioned on the words one and two, times the probability of the word two conditioned on the word one, times the probability of the word one. That is, we've worked, it th we've worked this probability out in factors, where every factor is the probability of one word, given the words preceding it. Uh, we could do this, incidentally, in any order. I mean, applying this rule, we could apply this rule in any order. We can condition the first word on the second and the second on the third. Uh, but since we know that we read sentences in order, starting with the first word, moving, uh, moving forward, this is a, a good way to decompose the joint probability over the sentence. So what this gives us? is that we now, in order to get our probability over a sentence, uh, we don't have to estimate the whole sentence probability in one go. We can break it up into the probability of each word, given the words that precede it. And we can build a model for this probability distribution. So if we have a model for this conditional probability distribution of any word given all the words that precede it, then we can compute those probabilities, chain them together like this, and get a probability for the whole sentence. So this is what we're going to focus on. This thing at the bottom here, this is the probability that we're going to model. Given some part of a sentence, what's the probability on the next word? Uh, usually we take the logarithm because these are, uh, we're multiplying very small probabilities. So these will underflow very quickly. So we take the logarithm, then it becomes a, uh, the product that we saw earlier becomes a sum. So the logarithm of the log probability of a sentence is the sum over the log probability of all the words conditioned on all the preceding words. That's what we call a language model, uh, which may seem simple, but note that a perfect language model, which perfectly predicts or gives us perfectly uh, uh, good probabilities on whatever word is going to come next. So we see a sentence here, the man fell out of the, what's the probability on the next word? A model that gives us very um, good probabilities on what w word is going to come next will uh, contain not only information about grammar, but also about these part of uh, parts of speech, but also about semantics and about physical reality. So the man fell out of the window, for instance, is a grammatical sentence which is likely to, be, to appear. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe in a, a news <clears throat> new story or something. I'm sorry. <coughs> um, so that's quite likely compared to other follow-up words. The man fell out of the aquarium is still grammatical but does makes a lot, lot less sense. Something really strange needs to have happened before this sentence appears anywhere. So aquarium should be less likely than window. The man fell out of the pool. It's still grammatical, but you need a very strange pool in order to be able to fall out of it at all. So this is physically less likely than the aquarium even, and uh, even less likely than the window. And finally, the man fell out of the cycling is an ungrammatical sentence. So these in order, for a perfect language model to understand this, it would have to be, have a kind of model of the world that knows that a pool 
and an aquarium are things that you can both, well, that an aquarium is a thing you can fall out of, but it's very unlikely. A pool is a thing you cannot really fall out of unless it's very strangely constructed uh, in order to rank all of these in order. So all of that is just to say that this function, if we get it absolutely right, the sort of ideal gold standard for this function is basically uh, AI complete. Contains everything you need to, to sort of uh, make an intelligence. We won't uh, do that. We'll simplify things, first of all, to approximate that ideal function. And the first way we will uh, approximate it is by making what's called the Markov assumption, uh, which brings us to the Markov models. And the Markov assumption is just to give the model a limited memory. So instead of conditioning on all the text that precedes the current word that we're looking for, uh, we just pretend that that probability distribution is equal to the probability, uh, probability of this word conditioned on the preceding two words, uh, or n words, in this case two words. That's not true at all, but it's a very helpful assumption. It's a bit like the naive Bayes assumption, we just pretend that it's true so that we can hopefully get a reasonably working model. Which gives us a Markov model. So now, to get the probability of a sentence, like congratulations, you have won a prize, we decompose the sentence, so we predict the probability of each word in sequence, starting with prize, which is conditioned only on the two words preceding it. We multiply that by A, conditioned only on the two words preceding it, and so on and so on, to get the probability of the whole sequence. And only the word congratulations is not conditioned on anything because there are no words preceding it. So now we have the probability that we're interested in of this sentence decomposed into the product of a bunch of conditional probabilities. So now we just need to estimate these conditional probabilities. And because they're now very simple, because they're only conditioned uh, on two preceding words, we can easily estimate this from data. So probability like prize, uh, observing the word prize, given that you've observed the words one and a, uh, can just be estimated by looking into your data set, just get a big bag of language data from somewhere, called a corpus, incidentally. You look in your corpus, and you see how often did I see this sequence, won a prize, and you divide it by how often you saw the sequence 1a. That's a pretty straightforward estimator for how often the word prize uh, followed the words 1a. And this limit that you put on your memory, that's called the order of the Markov model. So this is a second order Markov model. So that's pretty straightforward. You just count, basically, uh, occurrences in your data. Oh, yeah, incidentally, this thing at the top here is called a trigram. So uh, a sequence of three words. The thing at the bottom is called a bigram. A sequence of one word is called a unigram. And a general bigram, unigram, or trigram is called an n-gram. <clears throat> so you're just counting uh, trigrams and bigrams. And that's all you need to estimate your probabilities. <coughs> so what, we can, what can we do with the Markov model? Uh, well, we'll look at class, uh, prediction first, or uh, sorry, we look at generation first. That's sort of the most interesting way of showing what a model can do. We can ask it to generate text for us. And by looking at the text that it's generated, we can sort of see how well the model understands language. And that principle is always the same. So we have this distribution. Our model is a distribution on the next word. So what we can do is, starting with some seed uh, sequence, which we can get from the data or come up with ourselves, we start with a small sequence of tokens. And we just predict the next word using this model that we now have, add that word to the seed. So we get, sorry, um, we predict the next word, which gives us a probability distribution on words. We sample from that probability distribution, 
So we don't just predict the most likely word we sample from this distribution. Uh, we add the sample to the sentence and we loop. So we predict the next word and the next word and the next word. That's called a Markov chain. And one thing you can do is train this, or train it, uh, get your uh, use uh, Shakespeare for your corpus, and then produce text by a Markov chain, one word at a time. And you get something like this. This is from some internet-based Markov chain generator. Uh, and you can sort of, if you read this, uh, it sort of takes you a while before you realize it's not actually grammatical. It's quite, even though it's, uh, I don't know what the order here is, it's probably a second order Markov model. Even though it's only looking at two words into the, two words into the past, it's already generating something that looks quite grammatical and quite Shakespearean. So this gives us a sort of indication that the model is quite sort of, gives, has quite a good understanding of, uh, of some aspects of language. We can also apply this to a more traditional machine learning setting and a more practical machine learning setting. For instance, sequence classification. So if you think back to this uh, data set of sequences of, of emails that we wanted to classify, we can build a Markov model for that. So then this is ultimately the probability that we want to estimate, the probability that something is spam given the content of the sequence. So here the sequence is the whole email. Uh, and given that email, we want to know what's the probability that it's spam. Well, we've, solved, we've seen the base classifier, we can use that, which basically tells us that the probability of spam is proportional to the probability that, given that we uh, know that something is a spam email, that it looks like this, times the prior probability that something is a spam email. So if we estimate these uh, factors on the right, we have a, a classifier for sequences. Uh, the rightmost one, probability of spam, is easy. We can just estimate that from the data, as we've done before. And for the left one, the fact that this uh, probability that we see this particular sentence, given that the email is spam, we can use this principle of language modeling again. So we'll build a Markov model for that. So we want a Markov model, but now we want it conditional in the class. So same as before, we uh, apply the, uh, the chain rule of probability to break this up, in this probability over the whole sentence, up into factors for the probabilities of the words, like this. This is the same as before, except all the conditionals now contain the class, span. And uh, we've made this Markov assumption, so we only condition on the previous couple of words. So now this is the estimator that we want to compute from the data. Uh, so it's the same as before, two words, uh, we look two words into the past, but it needs to be conditioned on spam. So we split our data set into spam and non-spam, and only in the spam part of the data set do we count the trigrams and the bigrams and estimate this probability. So it's basically the same as before, except our corpus is split on spam corpus, non-spam corpus. And then, now the animations are slightly messed up. I'll just show you the whole thing. Oops. Uh, so the whole algorithm for a um, Markov model-based classifier looks like this. To train, we just count these uh, unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams for each class. So we split the data set into class. We count all the n-grams up to the order of the Markov model. That's our training. And then given a new uh, email, a new text, we want to estimate the probability of the class, of all classes, given the email. So we flip that round using Bayes' rule. Uh, so we want a language model on the content of the email given the class multiplied by the prior probability of the class, which we can just estimate from the data. And this language model on the content of the email given the class, uh, we just use these uh, 
Markov models. So the first one, the first uh, factor in this product is just a word by itself. The first word by itself, it's no preceding word, so it's not conditioned on anything except the class. That's why we need the unigram model. Then the second one is conditioned only on the first word. And then once we have this run up, so our, uh, we can look back into the sentence far enough, every factor is just the word conditioned on the uh, two words preceding it and the class. And this, again, we can estimate from these unigrams and bigrams for which we've counted the frequency. So that's Markov modeling. Uh, final couple of notes. Um, in this particular example, estimating email, actually a zero order Markov model is the best uh, option. So it doesn't actually buy you anything else to, to look deeper into the uh, history of the text. If for other settings it does. Um, it's almost exactly equal to naive base which we described in the probabilistic lecture, if you do zero order Markov modeling. Uh, if your documents have different lengths, doesn't matter for document classification or sequence classification, as we saw here, because you're only ever estimating the probability of the class given the same sequence. So uh, then the length doesn't enter into it because the length stays the same for the uh, two or three probabilities that you're uh, comparing to each other. But in some cases, you are actually comparing different the probabilities of different documents to each other. Then you need to be very careful about document length, uh, because you're multiplying these small probabilities with each, other, with each other. So for every word you add, the probability goes down exponentially. So if you don't control for that, then a long document is always going to be much less likely than a short document. And here again, you need some smoothing to deal with tokens that you haven't seen before. So what we do is we add uh, pseudo observations. So for every frequency, for every trigram, we add one to the frequency. So we pretend that before seeing the data, we've already seen one of every trigram. So that if we see a trigram that we've never seen before, the probability nev is never zero. So just add one to the frequency of the trigram, and then to make sure that all these probabilities still sum to uh, one, we need to correct by the um, size of the vocabulary raised to the power of the order. So raised to the power of three in this case, because it's a probability of a trigram. So if we do this, uh, then we get uh, Laplace smoothed probabilities like we saw in the naive base classifier. So that's Markov models. Um, <clears throat> which work pretty well, but they have a couple of problems. And one problem we'll look at now is the problem of words being similar sometimes. So for the Markov model, every word is just a separate entity. A set of all words is just a big bag of discrete, unrelated things. And they are either the same or they are different. There's no notion of similarity between words. <clears throat> which is a problem because it can actually be very helpful. So if you've seen out of the pool a bunch of times in your, uh, in your data set, in your corpus, then you know you can actually, uh, or we can actually infer that something like the gazebo, even if we've never seen the word gazebo in our data set, or at least in the context of this uh, uh, foregram, we can still infer that this is a noun. So it's much more likely to end up in this place than a verb like cycling. So just because we know that gazebo is a noun, we can actually give it a higher probability than the word cycling, even though both gazebo and cycling have never appeared after these three words in the data set. So it helps basically to have some notion of similarity between words. Same in the spam classification case. If we see an email, if we have the email, congratulations, you have won a prize, and we've seen that in the data, and we know that clearly indicates spam. And then we see the email, congrats, a reward has been awarded to you. It's all different words. So if we've never seen this bottom version before, uh, we have no information to base our classification on. 
But if we have some notion of word similarity, we can actually draw the conclusion that this email is actually very similar to the email we've already seen before, which indicates spam. So all of that just to say we, it can be really helpful to model a notion of word similarity, uh, but it's a difficult thing to do. And there's a couple of ways to approach this. There's one way that we're going to look at now, which is embedding models. So embedding models are applicable whenever you have a big bag of discrete objects for which you want to measure, uh, model some notion of similarity. We'll look at a couple of other embedding models in, in later lectures. And basically the principle that you always follow is you assign to each object in your space a vector, which we'll call EX. It's called an embedding vector. It's just a bunch of numbers. You assume that the embedding vectors of two objects are similar by some metric on vectors if the two objects are similar. So if you have two similar objects, you assume that uh, their embedding vectors will also be similar. And then based on that notion of similarity, you define a loss function. And then you learn to minimize that loss. So you minimize the values of these vectors directly. These, the values of these vectors are the parameters of your model. So that's a bit abstract, so let's look at how that works in practice for this, uh, uh, this case, where we are learning word, uh, word embeddings. Uh, in this case, we will build our model on what is called the distributional hypothesis. And the distributional hypothesis states, as it says on the slide, words that occur in the same context have different meanings, have similar meanings. So if I don't look at the word itself, but I look at the words before it and after it. And I look at the distribution over all the occurrences of the word, the distribution of the words that are likely to occur in its neighborhood. That distribution is a good proxy for the meaning of the word. So if I model that distribution, I'm modeling the meaning of the word. So that's what we're going to build into a, a machine learning model. Step one is we need representations for our words before uh, we do this modeling, so we're going to use neural networks. So we need input vectors. So our input vectors are just uh, one-hot vectors over our vocabulary. So we have a massive input vector. Let's say we have a vocabulary of 10,000 words, and this, these vectors have length, uh, length 1,000. Uh, 10,000, sorry. But they're zero everywhere, except in one place, which is the uh, index of the word. And these are assigned arbitrarily. But every word has a unique index, so every word corresponds to exactly one, one hot vector. So now we can feed words to a neural network. And now we can build a training set. Like I said, what we want to predict is what words are likely to occur in the context of another word. So we look at a big corpus again. We slide a window of some size over that corpus, in this case size 5 window, and for the middle word we take the words, the two words to the left and the two words to the right as words that occur in its context, the things that we want to predict. So we can build a data set like this, where given some word, we want to predict what word occurs in its context, and if we just slide this window over the whole corpus then we get all pairs of some word and some word appearing uh, near it. So we have a bit of a weird data set in that the labels, we have different labels for the same instance. But if we build a probabilistic uh, predictor on this, it's essentially a classifier. If we build a probabilistic classifier on this, we should get a good output probability on the words that are likely to occur in the context. And it turns out you don't need a very complicated model for this. So you can do a two-layer neural network. You give it a small hidden layer. So you go smaller and then back out again to this vocabulary size, the 1,000, uh, 10,000 in this picture. And we just map this one-hot vector of the input word to this uh, smaller hidden layer, which is then mapped back out and softmaxed to produce a probability. So it produces a probability on the vocabulary and after a bunch of training on this data set here on the left, we will see that the output probability assigns 
high probability to the words that are likely to occur in the, the context of the input word. And after we've done that, after that's converged properly and that model has trained properly, we cut off the top layer, we throw it away, we take only the first layer, and we take the value in this hidden layer as our embedding. So for the word compare, we feed it through this one linear layer, and we end up with a vector, and that's our embedding vector. So this gives us a vector representing the word compare. Uh, so I framed it as a neural network because it's usually described that way, but ultimately what you're doing, if you're uh, feeding a one-hot vector to a linear layer, which is just multiplying by a matrix, really what you're doing multiplying a one-hot vector by a matrix is just slicing out one of the columns because all of these entries here in the input vector are zero, one of them is one, so you're just by matrix multiplying a one-hot vector by a uh, matrix, you're just slicing out one of the columns. So after training this neural network, the columns of this linear, this matrix that represents this linear layer, are just our embedding vectors. And it turns out that if you do this, these embedding vectors are very representative of the meaning of the word, not just in the sense that similar words occupy similar parts of this embedding space, but also that for certain relations, it doesn't always work, but for certain relations you can actually apply algebraic manipulation. So for instance, if you want to get from the word king to the word queen, what you can do is you can take the word woman and subtract the word man, or rather subtract the embedding vector. So this V function maps a word to its embedding vector. So to get from the embedding vector for king to the embedding vector for queen, we can work out a feminine vector, which maps a word to its feminine uh, counterpart. We do that by starting with the word woman, the vector for the word woman, and subtracting the vector for the word man, which is sort of the step you need to take to get from woman to man as a vector. Then we take that vector, we apply it to king, and we look at which we get to some point in the embedding space, and we look at which words are near there, it turns out that the nearest word is queen. So here you see that represented. Here you see uh, man, woman, and if you subtract those from each other, if you subtract the man from the woman, you get this blue arrow here at the top left. And then if you apply those that blue arrow to other concepts, you'll see that they map into the uh, sort of feminized version of that uh, concept. Like I said, it doesn't always work and it's a bit controversial, but for some examples you get this kind of structure. Uh, yeah, so that's word to vec, which gives you an embedding, which gives you embedding vectors for words. And that can be useful, very useful to, uh, in, in lots of settings where you need that kind of uh, stuff. Question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so that's one of the things I didn't note, but it's in the notes here. So this is a lot like that that smile factor. So you're sort of trend. Yeah, you're for sort of creating or finding directions in this latent space or embedding space that represent concepts essentially. Um, it takes a long time to train well because you need to train a lot of data, but Google has done that for us. So you can download the embedding vectors, and you can build that into other um, other models very creatively. So that's embedding models, they will come back in the next lecture. But for now, this is a good way to model word similarity in a cheap way. And that's all I wanted to do before the break. So let's take 15 minutes and then talk about uh, recurrent neural networks. All right, let's get started again, find your seat. Part two. Uh, like I said, part two is all about how to apply neural networks to sequences, or how to do deep learning on sequences. Uh, so what we're looking for in this uh, part of the lecture is uh, 
sequence model. Uh, so a, a neural network model, a deep learning model, which operates on inputs of deep, uh, different lengths, because they're sequences, so we want the length to be variable, uh, but the weights to stay fixed. So it needs to be one model with one fixed set of weights that determine what the model is doing. And we want to apply that model with fixed number of weights to sequences of different lengths. The input is raw sequence data. As, uh, by raw, I mean something that is as close as possible to the uh, data as we know it, that captures as much, as, as much information about the data as we, uh, as we can. The output is classification, regression, or token prediction, just anything you want to do on a, a sequence. And the layers in general will be sequence to sequence model. So a sequence goes in, sequence comes out. So let's start at the input. Start at the beginning. So we already saw how to represent a sequence, a symbolic sequence. Let's say we have this uh, monophonic, bit of monophonic music. Then it's easy to represent it as a symbolic sequence. We ignore the ignore the time uh, information for a second. Um, and like uh, we saw with the word to vec example, we represent our symbols, the symbols in the sequence, as one hot vectors. That's why I picked a. Music as an example, because then we have only uh, seven input sim symbols, so it's easy to, to uh, draw. So we represent a symbol by a one-hot vector, and then our se input sequence is just a sequence of seven-dimensional one-hot vectors. And if we stick them all together in one tensor, that tensor becomes a matrix. <coughs> with the vocabulary on one side, one index, and the time on the other index. But unlike the images, where we just added one more dimension, uh, the batch dimension, to uh, turn this into a data set uh, tensor, if we take our whole day, if we have a bunch of sequences, a data set containing a bunch of sequences, and we put them all together, we cannot fit that into a tensor, because all the sequences have different lengths. So all the instances in our data set are sequences, but they might have different lengths. So we cannot, in a simple way, fit them together in, uh, in a tensor, and we don't really want to, because remember, we're building models that apply to sequences of different lengths. So the same model should be, we should be able to apply the same model to each one of these input matrix matrices. The only thing we want to ensure is that we want to feed our data set usually in batches, because that's more efficient. So while we don't feed the whole data set to the model in one go, we feed a couple of uh, instances together to the model in one go. And those sequences, we do want to have the same length, uh, because then we, it needs to be a tensor. So usually to uh, achieve that, we add a little padding to the shorter sequences so that within one batch, all sequences have the same length. And then we batch sort of in order of length so we batch together the short sequences and we batch together the long sequences and the medium sequences so that they're all roughly the same length so we don't have to add too much padding. And then we can we'll build one batch of instances that all have the same length. So that's the idea of padding. Uh, so this is sort of the data as we feed it to the neural network in this deep learning setting. So now what kind of neural networks can process sequential data. <clears throat> um, well, like I said, we're going to discuss one of them, which is the recurrent neural network. Uh, and this is sort of the original way of thinking about recurrent neural networks. We'll switch to another, another, another perspective uh, later on. But basically, when neural networks were invented, they were, base they were essentially uh, created by adding a recurrent loop to an existing feedforward neural network. So we have here basically a feedforward neural network from the input X to the output Y through a hidden layer H with two bias nodes. And the way we add this recurrent connection is by taking the previous hidden layer, so we feed X in sequence, and we add the previous uh, hidden layer to the input of the next 
time to the input the next time we feed forward. So we copy out the previous state of the hidden layer, feed it to the add it to the input, and uh, that gives us a kind of recurrent uh, connection as we add each uh, input in the sequence to the neural network. We'll look at this in detail, but first. Uh, I need to simplify the notation, the visual notation a little bit, because it's too complicated. So we'll simplify this uh, into something like this. So this is our visual shorthand for all that follows. Um, this is just a feed-forward neural network without recurrent connection. We have an input, we multiply it by a weight matrix, get a hidden layer, multiply that by a weight matrix, and get an output. Uh, biases are assumed. So we don't uh, explicitly write down the bias, no, bias vectors. Uh, oh yeah, and before we continue, I should say that most of the exposition in what follows is taken from, is adapted from this blog post. So there's a debt of gratitude there. So, uh, and this is part of the required reading. So rec uh, recommended to have a look at this, especially if you don't fully understand my explanation. So this is a normal feedforward network, and to add the recurrent layer, we draw it like this. So this point here where two lines meet, we interpret that as concatenation. So the hidden layer is concatenated to the input and fed through to the next hidden layer. So now how do we feed this model to a sequence? We have a, an input sequence, we assume we have an input sequence, x1, x2, x3, and so on. And we start by setting the hidden layer to zero, to all zeros, for now. Uh, and we feed the first example in our sequence forward through the network. The hidden layer is all zeros, so we just concatenate a layer, a, a vector of all zeros. We feed that forward through the network, and we get some output y. So corresponding to x1, we get some output y1, and then we move to the next item in our sequence. So we move now to x2. <coughs> we can get an A to X2, the previous hidden layer, H1, and we feed it forward through the network to get H2, which we feed forward to get Y2. We move to the third item in our sequence, X3. We can get an A the previous hidden layer, H2. We feed it forward to get H3. We feed that forward to get Y3, and so on. So that's, as you can see, by feeding our input sequence step by step to the model, we get an output sequence emerges step by step. So this is why it's a sequence to sequence model. So that's the forward pass. Now the backward pass. How do we train a model like this? Because things change slightly. So obviously we have an input sequence and if we have a target sequence, then we can compare the target sequence to the output sequence. Computer loss function that tells us how much they differ and how much we care about that difference and backpropagate that loss. But by the time we've, um, uh, if we're backpropagating this loss, if we have some loss on Y3, uh, the question is how do we backpropagate over a recurrent connection? Because by the time we uh, have computed H3, if we do it naively, then H2 has already disappeared. Not to mention H1. So how do we backpropagate over all these previous steps we've, uh, we've encountered? Uh, we can do that by uh, um, an algorithm called backpropagation through time. And backpropagation through time is, easy, is most easily explained by what's called unrolling of the network. So we unroll the neural network through time. So instead of seeing it as one neural network with a recurrent connection, we simply uh, specify it as uh, we specify all the computations we do at all the time steps. We see those as parts of one big neural network. So here we have one neural network, one big neural network into which we feed the input sequence. And uh, when, for instance, when we look at x6, x6 when we feed that forward to compute uh, the one hidden layer corresponding to that, we concatenate it with the hidden layer to the left of it, to produce the output y6. So now we have 
essentially, uh, instead of a, a temporal neural network, we just have one big neural network, which is wired in a particular way, and which has a lot of shared weights. So the weights on this connection here, and on this connection here, and on this connection here, they have to be all the same. But we know how to share weights, because that's just basically the multivariate, applying the multivariate chain rule. So we can just reuse the same weights here, that's fine. <coughs> And we can just compute the whole thing uh, more or less in parallel. We can't actually compute it in parallel because we need to compute this one first before we can compute uh, the, the second slice in time. But in general, we don't actually use the time dimension uh, temporally. We don't compute one slice after the other. We compute all slices and keep all slices in memory at the same time. So this is just a complicated neural network that we can, uh, we can now forget that this direction actually uh, is temporal. We don't actually have to compute it in time in that sense. And if we look at it like this, uh, and we compare the output sequence to our target sequence, it's very straightforward to just compute the loss. So let's here, we look at the loss just on the sixth uh, item of the sequence and backpropagate that loss through the whole network. Because we've unrolled it over time, we can just backpropagate this thing all the way down to the uh, first part of the network. And all these weights get, so these are all the same weights, so they get a bunch of gradients from every time they've been used. From all the six times they've been used in the sequence, these, grade, uh, these weights get a gradient, we sum the gradient and we train the network like that. Uh, sometimes it can help to truncate this gradient step a little bit. It's called truncated back propagation through time, where you do the forward pass over the whole sequence, but you back propagate only the last n steps, like in this case, the last three steps. Um, that saves a lot of memory. And you're still training the weights based on the most, uh, the most relevant information. Uh, so that can save a bit of memory sometimes. That's called truncated back propagation through time. So now we know how to set up a recurrent neural network, and we know how to train it. A uh, couple of things to note before we move on. Um, note that this is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, so a sequence of vectors goes in and a sequence of vectors comes out. Note that we have no Markov assumption. So we, read, we can read basically a, a potentially infinite or unbounded sequence for how, however long we like. We may need to use truncated backpropagation through time to save memory, but then can basically keep on reading the sequence. And note that the number of weights is fixed per slice of the input. So we have only for one point in time, we have a matrix W and a matrix V. So no matter how long we, how far we unroll the network, how long our input sequence, we always uh, have a model with the same number of weights. So the number of weights doesn't change as the length of the input sequence changes. And that's what makes it a sequence model. <coughs> so what, what we, can we do uh, with RNNs once we've trained them? Basically, we can sort of categorize this into what, the input, what kind of input we want, what kind of output we want. Obviously, if we have sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, then it's very straightforward. Uh, we can also do sequence-to-label, like sequence classification, like this spam example that I showed earlier or regression, like predicting the next uh, number in a sequence or predicting uh, another numeric uh, attribute of a sequence. And we can also do uh, label to sequence. So we can do sentence generation, for instance, conditional on some label, like generate a, sent a Shakespearean sentence versus generate modern English sentence. Uh, we'll look at sequence to sequence first. So the most straightforward, it's a sequence to sequence model, sequence in, sequence out. So the most straightforward way to do it is just to put the input sequence on the bottom, put the output sequence on the top, and that gives you a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. The only drawback with this is that um, when this model produces its first output in the sequence, it can only base that output on the first input, because it hasn't seen uh, the rest of the sequence from x2 to x6 yet. Uh, none of this information here on the right side of the sequence is allowed to flow to the start of the output sequence. So this only works if you can actually predict 
the first part of your output sequence based on only the first token in your input sequence. But if that's the case, then you can do it like this. So you just compare your target output uh, to your uh, actual output, compute the loss and backpropagate. Uh, a slightly more powerful way of doing sequence-to-sequence -sequence modeling is like this, where you only start the output sequence after you've seen all of the input sequence. So you just you generate some outputs at the start while you're still reading the input sequence. You ignore those. You stick a bunch of empty vectors after your output sequence, uh, after your input sequence. Sorry, you stick a bunch of null vectors, so vectors containing only zero. Basically, ign ignore these uh, inputs, and you start producing your output sequence as soon as you've finished reading your input sequence. And sometimes you even put a couple of empty steps in between, so where both the input and the output are null to give the model sort of time to process the input before it starts producing the output. So this gives you more, basically now you can uh, condition what you're doing here at the start of your output on even the last token in your input sequence. And then again, you compute the loss and backpropagate. Uh, sequence to label classification, again, is pretty straightforward. One thing you can do is just uh, ignore all but the last of your output uh, vectors, and then map this to your label space. Maybe by a fully connected network or something, you just project this down to the number of uh, classes you have. So like I say, pretty straightforward. The only problem if you do it like this uh, is that the distances are not the same for all of your inputs. So the distance between your output label from, your, uh, from the last token in your sequence to the output label is very short, and the distance to the first token is very long. So the model will most likely learn to look disproportionately at the later parts of your input sequence. So in order to avoid that, you can also uh, look at all of your output sequence and just average these values and then map that to your label space. Because now your distance to all the input tokens is the same. A labeled sequence is very straightforward again. So you can just map your input label uh, to a vector and repeat that vector. So you give it an input sequence, but every token of that sequence is just your input label. Or a different trick is to use this H0 vector that we used earlier, this hidden vector that you start with, which we set to zero, and put your label there. So don't set your first hidden vector to zero, just put your label in that thing, which frees up your input sequence to, uh, then you can either set your input sequence to zero or use some other data on your input sequence. So if you want to condition both on a label and an input sequence, then this is a nice trick to use. So that's RNNs, recurrent neural networks. Uh, and as I've described them, they work okay, but they have a bit of a problem with uh, remembering and forgetting. So if you have a long sequence like this, a good model, like the ones we have in our head, would know that the most likely next word here is not Dutch, but French. Because all the way at the start of this run-on sentence, it starts with the idea that the uh, speaker was born in France. So that's the sort of conclusion of the sentence should follow from that. But a language model is much more likely to say Dutch, because very, re uh, very close to the end of the sentence, there's a mention of Amsterdam. So a good language model might infer from that that we're talking about Dutch cities. So I'm fluent in some language needs to appear, so that might be Dutch. Uh, so in order to override it, that, in order to learn that actually in this kind of sentence, with this kind of sentence structure, you want to talk about France, so you want to, uh, we're talking about France, so we want to say that we're fluent in French. We need to remember very far back in this unrolled network. And that doesn't really work with standard recurrent neural networks. Uh, because... Basically, if you want to remember far back, you need to forget a lot of things. So what happens in a normal recurrent network, every word it observes overrides its memory. It has one memory, which is this hidden layer, and that gets overwritten every time it observes a new word. 
and it doesn't learn very quickly to ignore most of these words so that its limited memory can be used for friends. Basically, if you want to remember far back, you need to forget lots of intermediate words. And recurrent neural networks are sort of wired initially to remember everything they do. So in come the LSTMs, which reverse this process, and among the many things that LSTMs do, is they add a forget gate, which is initialized in such a way that by default, the LSTM forgets everything it sees, or ignores everything it sees, and slowly learns to pick up on the important things. So that when it starts learning, everything is forgotten, so the gradient sort of propagates all the way back down this neural long neural network, and then slowly it starts to pick up on the things it wants to remember, which can be either for deep in uh, its memory or nearby in time. So it has this selective forgetting property, which is controlled by learnable gates, which we'll look at in detail. Uh, and incidentally, this is probably sort of tied for first place with the convolutional neural network as the first deep neural network, where deep means deep in time in that it goes far back if in this time dimension. So the first thing we need to look at, and we'll look at it in isolation before we move to the LSTM, is the structure of a gate, which is very important in this LSTM. So it looks like this thing here on the right. Basically, we have some input vector. And what we want out of this little subnetwork here is a vector to add to, for instance, our memory or to something else. You see gates in lots of networks. But in this case, we want something to add to our memory. We want to select, based on what's in this input, whether or not and how much of it we want to add and what parts of it we want to add to our memory. So what we do is we map it by two uh, weight matrices, WS and WT, uh, which are fed to through different activations, through two different activations. One is fed through sigmoid activation, which we've seen already, which maps the whole, which maps everything to values between zero and one. And one is mapped to a 10H activation, which is just a sigmoid stretched vertically so that it falls between minus one and one. So it's just the same function, but stretched a bit. So on the left path here, we get a vector of values between zero and one. And on the right path, we get a vector of values between minus one and plus one. And what this basically does is the uh, left, oh yeah, and then they're multiplied. And that gives us our vector that we want to add to the memory. And the way you can interpret this is that this sigmoid side, this left side, um, gives us weights. Uh, no, actually, let's sorry. Let's do the right side first. So the right side are, you can interpret as the values that we're adding to the memory. And we want, at every time step, we want to limit the amount of stuff we can add to the memory. So the values are mapped, squeezed into this minus one, one interval, so that we can never add a value to the memory that is bigger than one or smaller than minus one. And then the sigmoid, is a multiplier that tells us how much we're interested in each dimension. So if the sigmoid value, if this results for a particular dimension in this vector in zero, then the whole thing gets zeroed out. No matter what the 10H does, if it's zero here, then nothing is added to memory. If it evaluates to one, then it's, all of it is added to the memory. So the sigmoid sort of controls how much of it gets added and how big this resulting vector is in every dimension. And the 10H broadly uh, can be interpreted as the actual values that we're storing in memory. So now we're going to build this into uh, a recurrent neural network. So we'll look at the whole picture first and then zoom into the, the details. So the whole thing looks like this. This is, uh, so we have a, an unrolled network composed of cells. So these orange squares here are cells. Every cell has one input, which is the current input to the neural network, current part of the sequence that we're interested in, one output, and it has two connections to the next cell. So these are two recurrent connections to the next point in time, two loops in our neural network, essentially. Uh, the C connection and the Y connection. So the Y connection is just the same as the output. So the output get pass, gets passed out of the cell as the current output 
also gets passed to the next uh, cell. And then there's the hidden state, the hidden layer, basically, which is C, capital C. So now let's open up this cell. Let's see what happens inside of this cell. Uh, we'll need to look, uh, elaborate our visual language a little bit. So we already saw concatenate. If two lines uh, converge, we uh, that means vector concatenation. If we see a letter, capital letter, on the on an arrow or on a line, we apply some weight. So the vector is multiplied by a weight matrix. Uh, this we've also already seen a sigmoid activation, so the vector is, we get a new vector from the existing vector by applying a sigmoid activation or a 10H activation. And then if two vectors concatenate in one of these circles, we apply an element-wise operation, like summing the two vectors together or multiplying the two vectors. So putting all that together, this is what the inside of a, an LSVM cell looks like. It's quite complicated at first, so we'll go through it bit by bit to see what's happening. And the first thing I want you to focus on is uh, this part at the top here, which takes this hidden state from the previous cell and produces the hidden state for this cell. And you can think of this as a kind of conveyor belt. So over the whole unrolled network, these hidden states travel from left to right, and the current cell has two points at which it can manipulate the hidden state and pass it on. So that's basically the basic operation of the neural network is sort of taking a hidden state, manipulating it a bit based on our current input, and passing it on. And we manipulate it by multiplying something by it and adding something to it. And then we pass it on. So that's the sort of the hidden state, the conveyor belt. Now we have to look at what do we multiply it by and what do we add to it. This is our memory, right? So what do we, how do we manipulate our memory and how do we add to the memory? So the first thing is called the forget gate, which tells us how much we want to forget from what we've already seen. So based on the current input, we multiply by weight matrix, sigmoid it, so we get a bunch of values of zero, between zero and one and we multiply that by our current memory value. So if this results in a vector of all ones, then we maintain everything we have in memory. And if this results in a vector of all zeros, then we forget everything we have in memory. And it's, uh, it's a vector, so we can decide to forget everything we have in the first dimension and remember everything we have in the second dimension. And obviously we can have values in between zero and one as well. So that sort of sets our memory as we have it and tells us, uh, based on our current input, sort of, oh, this is an important one, empty the memory. Then we apply this gate that we saw earlier to the input to give us an addition vector. So this, is, this gives us a vector of what we add to the current memory after we've sort of cleared it or not cleared it. And that's basically all the manipulations we do on the conveyor belt. So note that as the gradient back propagates down this conveyor belt, the only um, operations that happen along the conveyor belt are linear. So everything nonlinear is happening below the conveyor belt. So as the gradient back propagates through time, it only has to back propagate through linear operations, as complicated as this cell is. The back propagation through the conveyor belt only deals with linear operations, which helps these gradients to backpropagate without decaying, without vanishing, basically. So now that we've manipulated our memory, added the stuff we want to add to, to the memory, we need to figure out what our current output is going to be. So we look at the input, uh, we look at the conveyor belt, so we 10H the conveyor belt to restrict its output values, uh, we build a gate based on our current input. We multiply that by the, what we got from the conveyor belt. And that will become both our current output, which is also passed to the next cell, which is the whole operation of the LSTM cell. 
Five minutes left, a little bit more to see what we can now do once we have this LCM cell. So we have a very complicated model, but we know how to train it. We know how to we unroll it. We just backpropagate. So the first thing and the, the clearest way to show how powerful LSTMs are is to turn them into a language model. So I think back to the first half. We want a probability distribution that gives us, given a sentence that we've seen, gives us the, next, the probability of the next word. And now we're going to do it without the Markov assumption. So we're going to feed a whole bag of text to the model, no matter how long, and predict the next word. So training first, how do you train a, a language model like this? You basically, if you want to train a model to predict the next word, basically you give it an input sequence and you give it a, uh, the output sequence is just the input sequence but shifted back one word. So here we're predicting the next word, so the prediction after we've seen you should correspond to have. And what we do is we, oh yeah, and um, to make it more difficult, for the LSTM is uh, to, uh, sorry, to make it more difficult for the LSTM, we switch from word level models to character level models. So instead of predicting the next word, we're predicting the next character in the sequence. And our, so our training data is very easy to make. We just get a slice a bunch of sequences out of our uh, corpus and we uh, shift the target sequence one character to the left. And then we have an input sequence and an output sequence. We softmax what comes out so that we can interpret the output as a probability over characters. And then we can just train by categorical cross entropy. Then after training, we have a predictor for the next word, uh, the next character, sorry. And then we can do this sampling again, this uh, sequential sampling. So we start with a seat of characters. And then we can sample the next character based on, so we feed this seed together with an empty, uh, no, we just feed this seed to the neural network. It produces some probabilities for all the next characters and we just look at the top right probability vector here to get probabilities on whatever character follows this sequence. We ignore all the other outputs. We sample from that probability distribution that the model gave us and uh, add that sampled character to the sentence, and then we loop. So we sample character by character by character. So what happens if we do that? Uh, I didn't run this experiment myself, or at least not the one that produced these results. So this is from a blog post from 2015, five years ago already, uh, called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks, where basically this whole story is told. If you're interested in LSTMs, definitely read this one. And this blog post finishes up by a bunch of experiments on uh, different texts. So we'll start with the same thing we saw already, Shakespeare. But remember that the last time with the Markov models, we did Shakespeare on word basis, and now we're doing Shakespeare on character basis. So this model, uh, we haven't told it about words. It doesn't know what words are. It only know what, knows what characters are. And we're, all these words, it has learned from the data, from this fixed size of about four megabytes of Shakespearean uh, writing. It has inferred, it has basically learned that all of these words exist. So it built up its own vocabulary, when to, uh, yeah, uh, at least, or at least where to insert spaces. And it's using that vocabulary, it has learned to talk like this which is arguably more grammatical than the uh, Markov model, which actually had access to the words. So a couple of times it slips up, like strain here. Uh, but in general, you'd have to look quite carefully at this to see that it's not actual Shakespeare. Uh, but it can do more. So if you feed it, for instance, Wikipedia text, I don't know if you've ever edited a Wikipedia article, if you click the edit button, what you see looks like this. It's basically text, except there's these little bits of markup where you want to insert links or insert uh, structured information. And obviously there's a lot of Wikipedia text to train on. So if you do that, what you see is that the model actually learns not just to generate natural looking language, 
but also natural looking markup. So it actu uh, actually uses this link markup correctly. So all the links are closed. So you have some opening brackets here that are followed by some closing brackets right away, a couple of words later. But not only that, notice also that the things inside the links, the things that are links in this generated Wikipedia article, are actually subjects, things that uh, look like subjects of other articles. So everything inside this link uh, syntax are things like names, John Clare, or Scotland, or since Dajaurd, which is probably a made up phrase, but it still sounds like a sort of proper noun. You can also notice that it occasionally produces external links, which you also find in Wikipedia, links to outside pages. And when it does, as you can see here at the bottom, it actually learns to generate uh, URLs, valid looking URLs. So this is a URL that looks like it goes somewhere. It doesn't go anywhere because it's hallucinated, but in practice, uh, it doesn't. you can't tell from the URL itself that it's invalid. And sometimes it even sort of generates, uh, uh, it sort of goes into XML mode and it generates these snippets of structured information that are present in Wikipedia pages as XML. Final example from this uh, blog post, they also tried LaTeX. If you've ever written a document in LaTeX, you know how difficult it is to produce valid LaTeX that uh, renders properly but this model has less of a problem with that. Uh, I should say they had to fix a couple of problems before it actually rendered, but it can basically generate valid LaTeX that looks like this. And here's another example, not from this blog post, but uh, from somebody else who trained uh, this kind of language model on uh, tweets from Donald Trump. Uh, which uh, are very difficult to distinguish from the real thing. Uh, so if you want to, um, so this is a generative model, basically we're generating sentences, we're generating language. Uh, and we've had a whole lecture on generative models already where we sort of generated stuff from a latent space, where we sample a normal distribution and generate from that. Can we, so a question to finish up on, can we do this uh, can we combine this kind of generative modeling that we've seen in the last lecture or two lectures ago with uh, sentence-based generative modeling? Can we generate sentences from this kind of space? Uh, the most straightforward way to do it is to feed the, this latent vector, sample a latent vector from a normal distribution, feed it as the hidden state of a, an LSTM, which leaves us the input space and then we can use the, oh, sorry. Uh, so we can do that uh, in an, uh, we can turn that into a variational autoencoder. So this is just a variational autoencoder where the encoder is an LSTM and the decoder is an LSTM. Otherwise it's entirely the same. So remember the vari variational autoencoder, as we said it, could be used with any decoder model, any encoder model. So we can just stick an LSTM in there in the encoder and the decoder. Um, if you do that, you can do that on music. Unfortunately, the audio didn't, didn't work. So if you're interested in hearing what that sounds like, please have a look at the slides. There's a link in the annotations there. But if I play it here, the audio starts going woozy, so I won't do that now. And then you can combine the two to get the best of both worlds. You can actually train the decoder also on the shifted sentence. So here you have an encoder that reads the whole sentence, maps the whole sentence to a latent representation set using this VAE structure. But, and then the decoder learns to decode both based on this latent representation and on this shifted input. That's called uh, teacher forcing sometimes. And if you do that, then you can, for instance, take a data set of hand-drawn sketches by human beings. So that's sequential data because you get a sequence of coordinates on the page, as it were. This is from a Google data set where they ask people to uh, very quickly draw cats. I think you had something like 10 seconds to draw whatever the model told you, tell you, uh, tells you to draw. 
Um, you can train a VAE on that, and then you get a latent space on which you can in interpolate. So this is an interpolated lat latent space between a picture of a cat, face, picture of a full body cat, and I think pictures of owls. Can't really see over there, they look like owls to me. And what you see is that the, you get smooth interpolation. So all the points in the latent space decode to valid sketches of the thing they're supposed to be about. And about halfway in between the two, you get a, a sort of owl cat. And this one I already showed you. So we now know uh, how to fill this in. This is also one of these teacher forcing based models that uh, where you see clearly the difference between an autoencoder and a VAE. Uh, and to finish on, last slide, one thing you can now do is this example that I showed you earlier where you can uh, take an image, feed it through a convolutional neural network, and take the output of that convolutional neural network, stick it into an LSTM, and make the LSTM output a description of that image. So you need a data set, obviously, of images together with uh, descriptions like MS Coco is one of the more, the more famous data sets of that. And then you just uh, concatenate the two neural networks we've seen so far, the convolutional neural network with the LSTM, and you get a network that can... Uh, basically, if you just do it like this, you already get a network that can pretty well caption uh, existing images. Uh, I'll skip this. So that's my summary slide, LSTMs. They're great. They've existed for 20 years and they're still being used. Uh, so it's likely they won't go away for a long time. And they're very fun to play around with. So that's all I had for you. Thank you for your attention. And I will see you on Thursday when we talk about matrix models. <laughs>